This is getting to real time in a multi-model architecture. My name is Benjamin Nussbaum. I primarily help organizations transition from big data to smart data and understand the strategy around that as well as the technologies involved. So I work both on the business strategy as well as the technical strategy side of things and I do this for global organizations dealing in very large distributed systems. A lot of getting to real time is about having an understanding of the data that you're dealing with as well as the business requirements on that data. And initially we're going to start out here just with a little exercise looking at and kind of thinking through how to think about data as a business asset. Um, having watched the quote unquote database space evolve over the last five, six years um, and before that with NoSQL and Graph kind of all coming in, um, we've seen a lot of technology hype and technology tends to get very overhyped in my opinion where everybody, it's, it's really hard for organizations and individual practitioners to really weed through what is a, what is just the marketing and what is this technology actually going to do for me. Um, a lot of what I've ended up doing just out of sheer necessity and knowing which technologies are going to stand up under the requirements that, I, that we have in the organizations that we're working with and which ones aren't is to go very deep into the databases, the, the database offerings and the data offerings and the data strategy and really segment the whole data space into various sets of technologies that work well for different parts of the data process. Data is living. Data is alive. Uh, it does kind of embody that thing. It's not just a very static. It's not static in nature. It's very fluid. It's constantly changing as business evolves. The data changes. The data needs change, and data needs to be all things for all people. Everybody has a different way, depending on where they're at in the organization, that they need to look at the data, that they need to process the data. So we need to be able to treat and think about data in this way. So to get to real time, you have to start by separating your data concerns. What do I want to do with my data? What do I need to do with my data? Well, first, almost everybody has many sources. So you got to start by ingesting. That's one data concern. That whole process from connect to the sources, do the extract, transform it, bring it into a model that can be your representation of knowledge and your understanding. Anything downstream from your ingest and from your processing any AI or machine learning algorithms, they're all dependent on some understanding, a common agreed upon understanding within your data, which is even hard to get humans to do. But if you can't do that and agree on how you're going to talk about things, your ontologies, your nomenclatures, your semantics, your machines aren't going to be able to do that either and assist you in processing and analyzing the data. Uh, data comes in many formats, structured, unstructured. You've got to be able to store, store both. Unstructured data isn't so useful, so we've got to process it. So there's a processing layer there. We're going to take that unstructured data and structure it for at least the pieces of it that are meaningful to us. Then we need to contextualize, enrich, and improve the structured data. This is a really key, key component as you start to look at intelligence being derived from data and it being a valuable asset that you can make business, real business decisions based on. A lot of that comes through connection. Uh, the graph, I know the graph database space is very confusing because everybody did this whole me too, I have a graph thing. But the main premise that the context of how things are connected is where, where we derive our intelligence and our understanding from. It's how we as humans look at the world and how we see and understand. It's all about the relationships. It's how I see you know, Starbucks and how I feel when I'm drinking my Starbucks coffee. And, you know, when you start to map out the world, the places we shop, the places we eat, the people, you know, whether it's a city with power grids, power lights, streets, turns, everything, all of that is a network. And when you understand how they're connected, then you start to understand the context of your data. So you have to have your data in context. Data in isolation doesn't really do much for the enterprise. And once you have that context, then you can start to analyze it, whether it's human in the loop decision making or assisted analysis because we have a barrage of data that's too much for humans to look at so we have to use machines and then we want to be able to 
you know, have that context so that we understand how the machines are making their decisions and what they're recommending to us as well. And once we understand it, then we can start to drive decisions within the enterprise. A few um, key practices in the ways that I look at, at data. Uh, indexes are for direct retrieval. You don't want to be using indexes for traversal or navigating through many layers of data because the nature of indexes is they tend to create it's basically a lot of set mathematics, which we're not going to go into in this context, but it ends up really degrading in performance the more sets you have to combine together. Um, but what indexes are really good for is rapid responsive index values. So if you can design an index for a very specific, I need to, I give you this value and I expect this result back, You'll, it'll do really well for you. They're not designed for ad hoc or unexpected questions. So if you have, um, you know, if you want to ask a friend of a friend, you can design an index for that and get a really fast response time. But then if somebody comes along and one of your analysts that is, that's self-serving with their data says, well, I'd like to look at friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, and you suddenly don't have an index for that, well, it's super slow. And now you've gone outside of what you have indexes for, and now you're waiting minutes or hours or days for responses on your analysis. In the rapidly changing data environment, there's certain things you want to index, and there's certain things that you don't want to index. If you're, um, and so with indexes, it always involves the dev DBA cycle. It's not something that an analyst can just self-service on. So it can slow down the process of getting to real time and getting analysts or your decision makers that data that they need. Pointers for traversal. Graph databases have started to become much more relevant. And I've seen that when it comes to dealing with highly connected data, you need to be able to move through that network in a constant time. You can't have performance degradation as you join and as you go down through the network. And so what, whenever you're looking at database technologies, especially in the graph space, you want to look for ones that use pointers to do traversal. Indexes are good for finding a starting point. Like it's a very, very known thing. So find me Bob Smith's social security number, eight, one, two, three, four, five, right? Pull them out, now you have that data point. And now you can index, you can traverse, which is basically moving from one data element to the next. And so when you have a rapidly changing data environment, using pointers for this traversal, it doesn't penalize you if you say, I want to do a friend of a friend, or if I want to do friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, or take this street network and if we take out, if this intersection is blocked by an accident, what are the alternate routes that we can go around it, right? You can start to do very deep tree structures and analyze and understand very rapidly. It's optimized for that traversal. Use disk S3, et cetera, for your binary files. These are your unstructured files. There's no need to be trying to store them in your actual databases. Don't put large text files, large blobs. <laughs> Those just kill just about any database in terms of performance. So when you want to get to real time, you have to deal with more than one system and put the file types, the storage types, the data types where they belong. Search is for natural language. So you really want to focus, you want to include a search component into your, your architecture. You know, we're all used to typing into Google and being able to just say, I'm looking for this and get a response back. Analysts, business analysts, whenever they're dealing with data. You want your data to be searchable. You know, there's many organizations I go into and I see, oh, I have to put in this exact identifier or this exact name exactly as it is. There's no autocomplete, there's none of that. In an architecture that gets to real time, you want search to be a key component so that as your primary data updates, your search stays synchronized, everybody can continue to operate and work in a very fluid manner. Um, search servers shouldn't be used for other types of data storage. They're not designed for that. Their indexes um, are really meant for working with, with text. So when we look at separating the data concerns, there's really only one area that the database plays into. That's the storage and persistent layer. Everything gets called a database today, but w whether it's a semantic layer like RDF or a visualization layer that's just not storing anything, but they're aggregating from a bunch of things and just visualizing 
you know, a short-lived representation of it or a compute layer that's all in memory. Or even there's wrapper databases that basically wrap around, you know, Cassandra or some other storage engine and apply some reasoning and machine learning on top of it, and they call it a database. So what I want to do next is kind of go through, just in brief, the different types of databases that, that are out there. It's not, a, this isn't a very technical talk, it's very general. And so I just want to go through that because I think it's helpful in, if you categorize the technologies that are involved, that are available, where each one fits and you use it correctly, then you can get to real time much more effectively. So all the database things. DBMS is database management system, for those that aren't, may not know that. So the object database management system. This was popular originally back in the 80s. It started out. It's really designed for single applications because the notion is that whatever your application structure, your object structure looks like in your code is what gets persisted directly. So there's no translation layer. The challenge with that is in today's world with microservices, and even in just in a reality, the reality we face with many, you know, data is all things to all people, right? Everybody has a different view of the data. So there needs to be a separation between your applications that are using your data and the actual storage structure for it. So this was not a great option. Um, not really popular today, so we're not going to spend too much time on it. But that's roughly what it looks like. It was mapped to your code, and you could just persist and retrieve very simply. Uh, persist the whole hierarchy, you wouldn't have to deal with a translation layer. Native XML databases. Seems interesting, right? If, you have, if you're using XML as your communication language across the enterprise, if it's a standard structure, you can just persist it. A native XML DBMS is basically one that's designed to work with all the tags, understand it, and process it. It's not just storing it as a, as a text blob. Um, but today, that our data, it doesn't really deal with connection. And I view connection as a key in this age that we're in with under, you know, for understanding. And so native XML databases, while they're convenient, if that's your common language and structure, they don't really get you there as a primary data storage. But they are specialty systems. So if you have a lot of XML and you need to store and retrieve just XML, it could be a, a good option. Um, and the main thing you want to look for there is that the database natively supports it. It's not just storing the text, but it's actually processing the XML language. Time series is another one. The main thing that time series databases do and that they're used for, especially in the Internet of Things with sensors, is if you have streams of data that don't matter after a while, you can basically <laughs> leverage a time series database to read them in, and they're really they're not optimized for, it's not an application database, so you're not going to do your whole CRUD operations with your read updates and deletes. It's not meant to be a primary store. It's primarily meant to be a flow of data coming in where the newest is always on top, so your latest data is on top, and you can very easily kind of move back through that time to do analytics and analysis, but you're not doing it long-lived. There's no such, you can do deletes, but most of them don't really handle it well, They're not, and that's intentional. It's not designed to do a lot of updates and deletes. It's meant to write once and then read and consume from the top. And that's just an example. It's basically everything's time stamped. You're going, time is your primary, primary format, primary function. Search is another specialty database. It's not a primary database, and I, I, I think that's important because there are search engines out there that try to be a primary database, but they're, they're not ACID. They're not really meant for being a primary source of truth data store. And so what they're really great at, and what they should be used at, is that natural language textual search. You should be able to, and you can index many things and use them as, in very creative ways with different caching mechanisms as well. And we, we do this a lot for, you know, with Elasticsearch for uh, different requests that come in. And so there's a lot of things that you can do other than natural language, but it's primarily in that caching layer. It's not a persistent source of truth data store. Um, and this would just be a simple example. If you have you know, several documents that go in, 
create the index of where to find it, and then you type in you know, blue sky, and it's going to go through and pull out the documents that have that. And it'll rank and order, and you know, a lot of the value of using a real search engine that's designed for search, especially if you're doing you know, textual-based search, is that you get a lot of language support for different languages as well, which if you're using a search feature on another database that's not primarily a search engine, you can have a lot of, you can end up rebuilding a lot of what already exists in an actual search server. So I think RDF and triple stores are, are one of the more um, misunderstood ones that are out there. RDF is actually a semantic model. It's not a data format. So you can store RDF in many ways. You can be stored as, you know, with a, using tables, like in an RDBMS, or you can store it in a property graph model. But the main thing is um, there are triple stores that are specifically dealing with the RDF structure. And those are primarily optimized for that triple. And the triple looks like subject, predicate, object. So it's kind of that trio, that pair. And that's just one level deep. And when you put those together, obviously they look like a larger graph structure. And that's the nice model representation. But at the storage layer, if you're using RDF, it's not really a primary database format for all of your, it's really back your, your, to build your organization data strategy around, primarily because it doesn't give you, in the RDF databases that are out there, they don't provide that dynamic traversal that I was discussing when you're dealing with graph structures like this, you want to be able to do traversals. They rely on indexes, and they index, so they're very fast for the, for the RDF triple structure, but if you try to go outside and do dynamic traversals through that, the larger network that gets built out by putting many triples together you lose that advantage because those broader queries aren't indexed the same unless you build those indexes uh, specifically for the type of question you want to ask there. So I always find RDF database is a bit of a misnomer because it's a model, a semantic model. Um, key value stores. These are great for caching. It's really great for put data in, get data out. If I have the key and it's known, and I just want to put data in and get data out, uh, really great. They're not designed as a primary database, so you want to use it in addition to a primary database. Pretty much look like this structure. You have a key, it returns some value. So it's very fast, a few MS. Document store, another specialty database. Documents don't handle connections really well. It's flexible. It's, it became super popular with developers. The mean stack, a lot of front end engineers like it because you know, JSON's a language that's spoken across APIs. And so when you can just insert that into a document structure, work with that indexing at multiple levels, it can be an advantage uh, in very simple applications. Uh, you can do, well, comp I shouldn't just say simple, you can do complex applications as well. But when it comes to a primary source of truth database, you really want that ACID reliability um, across many documents and across uh, the, the, all transactions in the database as a whole. Um, so the way that I use document stores and I see them is as a specialty cache for very struct data documents where I want to put data in, get data out based on, on that document and that, that index. Uh, and they mostly look like this. So it's a very flexible data structure. If you have updates to it, you can just update the document, you can put it in, and then you build the indexes based on that. <coughs> Wide column stores. Um, this would be, it's basically just, a, uh, it's very flexible structure in terms of the, the columns. It's not fixed like RDBMS where you define a, a schema for your table. Uh, it's designed for very uh, distributed data inputs and data writes, and they tend to handle um, 
fairly large data sets very well. It look, kind of looks like a two-dimensional uh, key value store. Uh, they work, they're very performant when you're, as long as the data that you're asking for is within that, that same column, based on the way that most of them lay them out on disk. Uh, but if you start needing to uh, do joins or connect your data across many columns and try to bring it together, you still end up building those Cartesian products, which slows it down. Um, but these are the wide column stores that become quite popular uh, as well. Relational database. So this may be the one that everybody's most familiar with. Um, it's historically been the backing store for your primary data throughout the enterprise. Uh, fully acid, fully transactional. Gives you that persistent guarantee that your database is there. It's got you know, a few decades of buildup around it. So it's very, uh, there's a lot of good tooling. You know, as an architect, it's not just about looking at what technology is hip and new and what is the most amazing thing. It's what's the tooling that's around it and what is that going to be able to provide as well. Uh, and so relational databases have this for decades. And it, it does uh, really well on set operations. If I have a set and I need to filter, sort, aggregate, uh, within a single table, very performant, very fast. When you have to put multiple tables together, like persons and accounts, or you know, go a few levels deeper, do that friend of a friend of a friend type scenario, or look at street networks or power grids, whatever it happens to be, you start to see breakdowns in the performance simply because of that join pain where it starts to get two, three levels out, and you're like, can't do this, it's not working well. Um, so, I think that's where uh, the relational database, you know, it's simple to understand. It looks like Excel, people kind of get it. But it's a very it's an uncomfortable way to store and deal with data. You know, data in the world doesn't exist in table structures, and we force it into that structure because we haven't had a better option. Um, but it's done a really great job in terms of the reliability and everything for a lot of years. Um, mostly it looks like this, relies on foreign keys, foreign key references to do those joins and to bring the data together. And that large Cartesian product that forms across the multiple sets that get brought together is ultimately what slows it down when you're dealing with highly connected data. Graph DBMS. So Graph DBMS is designed to retrieve data in a, for a connection-oriented model. This is really dealing with connection, connectivity. Um, connections that are the edges. So edges in a graph database are as important as the data entities themselves. So they're basically like a super node. In, in graph databases, you're dealing with relationships that connect two data things. And that relationship lets you rep the, represent the context of how those two things are connected. And that's where you get your uh, additional advantage in the organization because with a graph, what you would draw out on the whiteboard and what you, in terms of how things are connected, if you have a person, if you have Ann and Bob and Ann loves Bob and Bob loves Ann, and maybe the only reason you did those two relationships is because Ann loves Bob and there's a weight of, or Bob loves Ann and there's a weight of 0.8, Ann loves Bob and there's a weight of 0.2, she's not really feeling it, right? And so now you have a much more complete picture of that relationship than just, oh, Ann and Bob are connected through a foreign key, right? So you can start to deal a lot with weighted edges. You can do confidence. How confident, so confident are we that this source told us that these two people met at this location at this time? Uh, how confident are we in you know, this company's assessment that you know, their value is this, right? Or, whatever it happens to be. When you can use weighted edges as you traverse through the network, now you can start to answer a lot of interesting questions that you couldn't answer before. And so the key things that you're looking for in a graph database is that properties are supported on both nodes and edges, and that the database guarantees referential integrity. With highly connected data, that's one of the most important things because you always want two nodes, which are your data elements like Bob and Ann, to agree on a relationship between them. If you say Bob knows Ann, 
Well, you want Anne to know that she knows Bob, or if Bob loves Anne, and now you disconnect that relationship, you want them both to agree on the state of that. Make sure you get a graph database that's fully acid and transactional. You want to avoid those that aren't. And make sure you avoid graph databases that use indexes for traversal. If you use indexes to move through your graph, now you're back in that same scenario where you have to update your indexes if suddenly you want to say, you say, oh, well, I wanted to find friend of a friend, but now I want to find friend of a friend of a friend. Well, I need to build an index for that. And a graph database that uses pointers for traversal instead of indexes, that won't be a problem. You'll just be able to say, follow, start with this person and, or this set of people and find all their friends of friends of friends. And you'll get constant time traversal as you go out from that starting point. What I'm seeing over the last five years of when I first used a graph database, it, it blew my mind. That was about almost six years ago. And it was for the single fact that I could now store and represent data in the way that I saw it existing in the world around me. I didn't have to transform it and force it into rows and columns. And I could talk to an organization. In a, within an enterprise, I could talk from the business folks, the CEO, down through to the sysadmin, and everybody understands it. Because when you go up on the whiteboard and you start drawing nodes with contextually relevant relationships about how they're connected, what they do, what their meaning is, everybody can understand the business concepts. And that data model is exactly what goes into your database. And that breaks down barriers across the organization. Because so much about, a lot of what I end up doing is helping organizations become connected enterprises. It's not just about technology choices. It's not just um, about this data process or that data process. It's about breaking down the way that we work together across departments, across groups, and creating common languages, common knowledge for how we understand our business and what we're doing. This is a language that everybody understands. And so I, I see I've been using graphs as the source of truth, primary data store as a replacement for relational databases, uh, and use relational databases as a specialty database. That's the way I've been using them for the last five years. I uh, primarily use Neo4j because it's the only, it is the only graph database out there that gives you that uh, pointers for traversals and doesn't use indexes. So, um, and that's coming from just an objective practitioner. I'm not, I don't work for Neo4j, but I've looked at all the other ones and we've kind of seen Oracle and everybody else go, me too, I have a graph, but all they've done is put a graph API on top of a relational database. And so when you try to do those <laughs> dynamic traversals, you hit a bunch of join pain. So it kind of defeats the purpose. This, I was just have a question, like, how uh, this is very interesting. Uh, you know, right now, there's a lot of problems. I mean, we have a situation where the customer information is stored on top of the financial industry, like where I work in multiple lines of business. So you've got a customer, you have a tax ID, you have a Mm -hmm. You have other lines of business in common sense, you have like a business units, you know, you uh, just like a different hierarchy. So we have like three different hierarchies mm -hmm. of the same customer in various lines of business. So maybe this is a problem, this is the solution maybe, because you're connecting the, the three hierarchies for the same customer. Yeah. You know, they're talking a common language, you know, maybe. I, don't know, I'm just trying to I, I think it could be. I mean, we can go into it in more detail afterwards. Um, I've got a few use cases that I'll talk through here. Um, but yeah, when you're dealing with uh, you know master data management is a, a one of the big use cases we've used Graph for because Neo4j specifically gives you a flexible schema. When you want to define a person, the first thing you do is you don't sit down and say, okay, a person's going to have a name. It's going to have a first name, last name, social security number, whatever. Right? Uh, you basically create nodes, and nodes can have what's called a label. And the way to think about that is it's more of a tag. So you can say, I'm creating the conceptual notion of a person, and I'm gonna give a node the person label. And now I can think about, okay, I have a person, and they have an account, and they shop at this place, and they live at this address, and they work at this, with this company, right? And so now you have started to create that, basically a mind map of that. And so now if I have many systems that all have the concept of a person and I need to bring that together, well I can bring in a source person from database A and a source person from database B and a source person from database C 
and bring them into the graph, and then I can do operations across that notion. I can say, go process all the source persons and do deduplication, do detection, like do all this processing and determine, okay, this is Bob Smith. This is my source of truth person, my representation of Bob Smith. Here's a source, here's a source, here's a source, and I can keep those sources synchronized and updated. Um, so we end up doing a, a lot of that with graph, and it provides that flexible uh, structure to do that. A lot of the other thing I've seen in databases is the one database that does all things. It's a multi-model database. Uh, that's kind of that me too thing, but it's also just some databases or document stores and graph and you know search. And I, I look at that and I'm just it puts you in a tough situation as the one that's building that database because now you're in a position where you have to make trade-offs. You can't be good at every model. It, at least not in a short period of time. Uh, to build a database from scratch takes probably 10 years to really harden it and get it to a really good place. And so if you sit down and say, we're gonna build the best document store in the world, you better plan to spend 10 years doing that. If you're gonna build the best graph in the world that does traversal, handles everything natively in, a, uh, in an optimal way for dealing with highly connected data, I'm going to spend 10 years getting it to a really solid point where the enterprise will pay attention to it. And so a lot of these multi-model databases, that um, what they end up doing, and I see it mostly as a market, it's convenient for developers, but it's also a bit of a way to ride the marketing waves. They basically end up, they have one underlying storage engine, and then they put APIs on top of that that make it feel like a graph, or feel like a document, or feel like whatever other model they're trying to support is, but when it gets down to actually persisting that data, it's using the underlying engine. And so when you look at, yeah, um, I, I can go in, we can dissect specific examples if there's questions about that maybe uh, afterwards. But, um, but yeah, just be wary of, wary of what the actual model is that a multi-model database favors and how they're doing persistence because that'll impact your performance, especially as you scale out. And then there's what I call not a database. So, <laughs> Um, it's really popular to be a new database right now. Uh, you may not have noticed that, but there's a lot that have come on the market that all they're really doing is leveraging an existing storage engine, whether it's Cassandra or you know something like that, and putting an API layer around it that basically lets you do one that I saw recently uh, uses Cassandra as its persistence engine. And then all it does is put a machine learning and AI, AI layer around it, which is you know, it's a great concept. But then it's marketing itself as a database, which is really confusing because it's not actually a database. It's an intelligence and reasoning engine that happens to use Cassandra as the backend store. And so in my model and the way that I think about it, those things are separate concerns. I want my persistence and storage layer to exist, stand alone, and be something that I can control, design around, update, and then any of my artificial intelligence and machine learning processing is going to consume from that database, do the, do the processing, and then update the database, put it back. And the same with all-in-memory databases. That's really a compute layer. Anything that's all-in-memory and isn't persistent is not a database. It's a compute layer. And yes, you want to do compute. You need big compute for certain operations, and that's good. And that's fine. But just don't... Um, if, you, if you think about it in these kind of areas of concern, it'll avoid a lot of confusion and help you really ask the right questions to the vendor whenever you're evaluating different offerings. Um, and then same thing with the semantic. Make sure you keep your semantic representation of your data out of decoupled from a specific database. And you can do that and keep it separate. You can define your ontology, your semantics, your RDF, if that's what you're going to use, um, that specific model. You can do that and keep it all separate. So real world, real time. These are a few examples that I've seen. And a lot of this comes down to making sure you pick the technology that supports the shape of your data. So if your data isn't connected, is not highly connected at all, and when I say highly connected, it means 
I need to ask questions that require me to start with a thing and go maybe three, four, or five. Anything more than three or four in your relational database is going to start to struggle. Um, levels out from whatever that data point is. So in this first one, we've got businesses buying and selling of online advertising. You've got maximum of one hour to update bids. And the original technical stack was three terabytes, a SQL RDBMS, distributed, federated, highly indexed views, just to get it close to one hour. And then at a certain point as they scaled, it started taking longer than an hour to compute what's our next bid. Anybody familiar with that business area knows that you'll lose thousands of dollars or more very quickly in any given day if you don't have your bidding correct. So the challenge that they encountered was it took more than an hour to update the bids. So in my work with them, we went in and started looking at their structure, their tables, how they modeled their data, what, what was really involved. And we discovered that it was a very highly connected structure, that this clickstream data coming in, connecting it to different sites, connecting it to their, their different signals, everything that was involved in kind of making that decision um, resulted in very deep tree-like structures. And which I, I initially looked at and said, okay, well, that's a graph. I see a graph here. You're not dealing with you know, a lot of set operations that are you know, mostly limited to one or two tables. You're dealing with a very dynamic graph structure that depends on who looked at it, the clickstream, the site, like all of these things, and you're trying to make decisions based off that update your advertising. We converted that from the SQL solution to Neo4j, and we saw that on 10% of the original hardware, so no distributed, no federated queries, single Neo4j instance, uh, we could write over 2 million nodes and edges per day from that clickstream coming in. And we could answer the question of what the next bid should be in under 300 MS. So we went from over an hour not finishing. We took an OLAP operation and made it OLTP. Now, you can also start to do interesting things around intelligent bid optimization, incorporate other strategies, even enable them to search through, integrate it with Elasticsearch so the data ties in. Uh, or in, updates in Neo and auto indexes into Elasticsearch. And that starts to change the way that a business works when you can go from OLAP to OLTP. Because now you've created a new reality for the organization that they couldn't do before. Here's another one that maybe is a little more tangible. So one, of, um, one scenario that I was involved with, they were selling complex content packages. And these content packages can have, each piece of content can have different rights related to the region it can be distributed in, the, whether it's exclusive, the time that it can be distributed, uh, and so on. There's hundreds of thousands of attributes, and almost every piece of content in this type of business you create, <laughs> it's a very uh, dynamic uh, set of attributes because you're trying to get a deal done with um, different play out facilities that will actually um, be showing the content, right? And so in this scenario, they had a highly optimized uh, Oracle solution that where they were generating billion row hash tables and there were that stored procedure, there was only one or two subject matter experts in the world that could actually make modifications to it without just breaking the whole thing. So as a business, that's a terrible place to be in from a risk perspective. Um, and they had just accepted that it was going to take four to six hours for a sales rep to get an answer on whether or not I can even do the deal or if it conflicts with somebody else. So if you have a team of salespeople selling this content packages and you're negotiating with Netflix and you're like, I'm going to sell you this, 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 and this, right? And you're going to play these out in this period of time. And they're like, great, let's try that. And you're like, okay, I'll come back tomorrow and let you know if we can do that deal, right? That's not really working if you're a salesperson. <laughs> um, and so, it was very highly connected structure, very dynamic. You don't want to have to update indexes based on how the attributes and everything change. We brought that into uh, Neo4j and not only brought it down to some second interaction, but could enable through a dashboard the entire sales force, uh, give them a content optimizer, a package optimizer where it can make recommendations. 
Now it can say, based on how much we make off this piece of content, you should actually include this together. And oh, this type, this organization that bought from us last time, we know they like these things, so you should try to sneak in this other piece of content. Because most, when you're packaging many pieces of content together, you've got your prime content that everybody wants, and then you've got your stuff that you make a lot of money on that's kind of older content, right? And so when you can start doing that, now you've changed the way that they work. You've helped them think about their data differently because they're not taking four to six hours. You move from an offline process to an interactive bid, negotiate, basically a negotiator AI that helps them in that negotiation. Yeah? So a lot of times when you get to kind of a capability that says, plus recommend based on experience and that kind of stuff, aren't you kind of working also within uh, uh, warehousing analytics and segmentation schemes and that kind of stuff? Yeah, a lot of um, the graph structure integrates with its analytics, its historical data, its kind of the current, its kind of past, present, and future. Like when you start getting to that recommendation, you should do this. So uh, was it integrated into your solution or did you interact with analytics? Right. Uh, so a lot of, the way that you get started with something like this is it's, it's not a rip and replace. It's a put it adjacent to everything that exists today and then bring it in. It's a very safe step for the organization to take because no enterprise wants to do a rip and replace. So you always stick it adjacent, right? Yeah. And then you can start to transition to it um, kind of at your, at your speed. But, but not, not in, inter interactive with an existing uh, EI or, or analytic capability for this particular use? For this particular case, no. And one more. Um, so in a highly regulated global financial institution, um, if you're dealing with data lineages, so that data lineage is basically, this data came into our system, it originated here, this process acted on it, this thing happened, it transformed in this way, this new derivative work of this data was created and it moved through the system for um, GDRP or any of the compliance requirements, you have to be able to provide uh, kind of the history of how the data came in and moved through the system. Um, challenge here, for complex lineages, uh, Oracle SQL wasn't even finishing. So there was no way you could return the lineage in our lifetime. Tested it out, timed it, clocked it, and said, oh, for the, when it gets past this level of complexity, it's never gonna finish. Uh, so these were very deep structures. You can have millions of paths in these structures. And moving it to native graph, Neo4j, it finished in under a minute. And that's just an example, a very powerful example, from not finishing to finishing in under a minute for having your data ma shape match the t technology that's designed to handle it the best. And so in our architectures that I put together, I usually stay away from a one-size-fits-all multi-model database that says it does everything, and I pick the databases that will do one thing well. I pick a primary database. Instead of relational, I'm going with Neo4j today. And then I use Elasticsearch for all the search server. And then if I really need a document store, I'll pull in Mongo or something alongside of it. But most of the time, I put my JSON documents into Elasticsearch because it's basically that index of text documents is a similar structure. Uh, and then I handle that processing and integration like I showed in that diagram adjacent to those primary database systems. And so that's really let me move from, uh, move, move to real time in that. So thank you. Questions? Uh, any, any experience with uh, protocol buffers as a mechanism for binary handshake between uh, more of an application layer than a SOA architecture that could leverage a lot of this in real time? Um, No, I have. It, it really moves more to the binary. It, mm -hmm. it eliminates a lot of the schema shipping. The, the okay. Uh, maybe we can talk about it afterwards. I'm not okay. too familiar with that. Step. Yeah. Um, we're dealing with millions of users. Is it a complex coming from the web? So let's find the loudest sample as a model. Even if it's 
So, do you see any other alternate models that can scale with the very low latency web based applications with the concurrent sheets? With what kind of? With the low latency and concurrent data. There's a lot of concurrency between, you know, like how many millions of users are there, how many 200 million users are hitting concurrent data at the same time. Mm. And uh, even though we have a lake underneath, we have a lake, but here in Cassandra, as yeah. uh, you know, because of the latency. I mean, and that's for the model we're proposing. Do you see any issues with your model? I'd have to look at your model. I wouldn't be comfortable just. No key value pairs. Oh, key value for for a store and retrieve. Yeah. I know the key, and I'm gonna. I want to yeah. be able to pass in this key and get this payload back. Mm -hmm. Key value is a good structure. If that's all you have to do, if you don't have to ask connection centric questions that say, okay how does this user connect to this other user or take this user look at their network and overlap it with this other user's network and then show me you know similarities or you know do any nearest neighbor or any type of things that are more connection centric questions and you just say uh, i have this user and i need to put this data in and get their profile back like if it's just take the user id give me something back that store retrieve mechanism sure key value store will do that but if you're getting to the place where you're like, okay, I want to take this user, and then I want to be able to enforce some restriction based on visibility restriction for security of, okay, who can this user see, or who can see this user, or, you know, it just depends, I don't know the exact use case, but, you know, if you're asking those connection-centric questions, key value will run into that same type of, you know, pain of moving through the network. Those, you know. Yes, or go ahead. Um, for your last question, your last example, the data linkage example, on your node, do you store actual data or metadata? Uh, so data lineages are the metadata. It's describing how the data has moved through the network and the transformations that it's taken place. And so you can ha you can have physical rep you can some systems are physical, some systems are logical. Um, but we're not actually in that case storing the actual data. It's just the lineage of how the data moved through the systems that are storing the data. Yeah. Yes. I guess similar to that question, but how would it work with a time series or like an event stream? Is it, is it designed to handle all those multiple records, or should it work alongside like a time series database? Um, so the you're asking. Let me just make sure I understood. So the should you use a time Time series for the lineage alongside it, or? Or would the time series data be in the graph itself? It would be in the graph itself. It's kind of Im implicit in the lineage. <coughs> because if you're not dealing with, um, with the lineage, you want to be able to do, uh, you have to be able to look back through time and kind of check it. And so, uh, so I, I, I don't use, I don't actually use a time series database um, just for that because in Neo4j as a, as a, I can represent a time series very efficiently because of that pointer traversal. So I get about as, I get really good performance going forwards and backwards through time um, because of that constant time, no matter how deep you go. Um, with data lineage, there's so much other metadata that if I have, if you needed to try to bring the time series out of the time series database and put it into the graph, I think you'd end up with slower uh, performance blending the two together. Um, so in that case, in that case, it would just use the use you know 4J. The time series database is really for I have a stream of like sensor data, and I don't care about it long term, and I'm just going to cut it off at some point or let it eventually expire. And so it's more that short lived scenario where you just want to be able to look at the most recent. It stores it in ascending order, so the most recent is always at the top. Like with a data lineage, you have to be able to go back and say, okay, well show me this, <clears throat> show me where this, you know, show me the end of this. Like, you know, I don't care that it's current here, but show me where this data originated. So it's more the data, uh, the data path, the path that the piece of data that you're interested in took, rather than time that's driving everything. Yeah. You had mentioned that you, you've been using graph as the graph database as your master database for a, for a while now. Yeah. What kind of pitfalls, I guess, would you have for folks who are using a relational database as their master, but 
want to maybe project into a graph for certain use cases? What kind of, like why, you know, is that bad or would you advise highly against it or are there pitfalls to, to watch out for? I mean, from the relational master into a graph no, I mean that connector is is common. It's a, definitely a good way to start using leveraging graph for certain workloads that are very graph centric. Um, and you know, I can talk more about how you kind of ease into that transition and kind of do that, leave them both online at the same time. But I think I'm out of time. So. Right. Thank you.